come back in. All right. You know, and that means that we come back in and, you know, the chit-chat, it starts to come to a, a lull, and, uh, all right, the parties that are conversating in the front or in the back, you know, I have no problem calling you out. Brooke, you know, you guys. It's my turn to talk now, not yours, okay, because Pastor Tony has a message for us, and you know when she's preaching, we better get ready, it's going to be full of life and full of energy, and uh, there's never a dull moment when this woman starts to give God's word down. I'm gonna, I am going to pump this up, because I know that you're going to have to fasten your seatbelts and get ready, so let's just say, get ready, get ready, get ready. All right. So just a few announcements we got to take care of, just some business. You know, last week I was told that I had to make sure I made a couple of announcements by uh, Shauna before, you know, because she's gone the next two weeks. But the marriage class starts this Friday at 7 o'clock. All right. It, if you want to be a part of that marriage class, one, you have to be married and you have to come with both. I just was told that my, I couldn't just send my wife. I tried. And they said, oh, no, she comes, you come. I'm like, she's the one that needs all the help, not me. So what does that tell you? I need the help, right? <laughs> so that starts at 7. If you don't have the book, it's okay. They have some extra books. You just got to pay them an extra $5 for the book. I was waiting for it here. No, you don't have to do that. Anyway, they have extra books. So sign up online because they need to know how many people are coming so that they can be prepared, Okay. So if you don't know how to sign up online, then, then just corner Sean, Bridget, raise your hands together because you're married, all right? One of those two, all right? And they will make sure that they say, oh, okay. And no, no not you because you're not part of this. You're not married. You're just a, we'll do the good. I want to make sure it's, I want to inspect when I get there. All right, I'm like going too far, okay? All right, the next thing is the car show is coming up, right? And I was told that we had to make sure people got signed up, okay? So if you haven't signed up, according to Shauna, I'm going to say it like she would, you need to get signed up, right? Because that's what she made that whole thing, you know? So you got to get signed up. There's going to be uh, six-hour shifts, I believe, on Friday and Saturday. And so they need help with that. So please get signed up. This is a way for us to reach our community. This is one of those things that we're saying when we, uh, our offerings help take care of things like that so we can do things in the community. And then also there's help with a shoebox giveaway. And so you need to talk to Bridget about that. That's her baby. So talk to, to Bridget about that. And then we also still need help in the sound booth. So in order to get, if you want to help in the sound booth, please talk to Marissa. And uh, because, you know, Curtis is, driving right now he's in Texas he's almost to his destination in a couple hours probably so uh need to keep praying for him and then we need children's church workers now, I don't see uh Pastor Deborah here but I do know that oh I know you're here but I'm looking Flo I don't see her she was just here but anyhow you can find Flo and let her know, but you can also sign up online as well. So we just want to make sure all these areas get covered. These are opportunities to ministry. And so when you become that new creation, part of that is serving and helping because, you know, we can't do this by ourselves. Pastor Tony, pa <coughs> excuse me, Pastor Tony and Pastor Jerry can't do this by themselves. They need the help of the entire force that we have here. You know, and we have a great team. It's a family. And so when we are as a family, we do things together. Amen. We might have issues at times, but all families do. But we love each other and we work through them. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let me say this. Pastor Tony's going to come up here in just a second. And when she does, let's give her all that, you know, huge, you know, whatever you do at your football team, right? Because I know my Dolphins are playing right now and, you know, they're doing really good. Okay. But, uh, you know. But we want to support our pastors, and we want to encourage them and let them know we appreciate them when they are bringing forth the word, okay? So let's just give her a rousing, like, encouraging, like, whoop, whoop, okay? All right? All right, let's go. Whoop, whoop. Good morning, good morning, good morning. 
Greetings from Pastor Jerry. You guys know he's at work. So we are going to continue. He's been teaching on a change of heart. And before we get started, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to do it today. I want everybody to stand. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come on in, right? Holy Spirit, we surrender to who you are. We surrender to your authority in this place. Holy Spirit, everything that's not right in us, we ask you to take it out and burn it out right now. Open the eyes of our understanding that we may see, that we may hear, that we may know, Father. I ask you, Lord God, to come on in this place. Manifest yourself with signs, wonders, miracles, visitations, and manifestations of who you are. Speak individually to us, Lord God. Open the hearts and the recesses of our minds so that we can comprehend, so that we can understand the depth and the height and the width of your love, Father. We ask you today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we proclaim you as Lord, as Jesus over our lives, over this church, over this region, over this area, and we take authority. We step into all that you've called us to, God. We thank you right now, Lord God, that you are supernaturally superseding things in our recesses of our mind. I pray for our children, Lord God, that they will just receive a deposit of who you are in a tangible way today. We ask you to touch us. We ask you to cleanse us. We ask you to help us. We ask you, Lord God, to come in and do only that which you can do. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. You can be seated. This is not on my time. New season is good. Don't, don't start that clock. <laughs> It's off. Yeah, they, they haven't started yet. This new season is going to take a new energy and a new push and a new authority that we've never walked in before. And some of you guys are going to have to get a little bit more bolder and walk in more authority. Because Jesus didn't do anything except with the authority that God had given him. But he's giving that authority to you. So some of you guys are going to have to start taking the authority that Christ has given you. You're going to start opening your mouth and proclaiming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and standing in it. And some of you just need to, I don't know how to, how to say this, but some of you guys need to dig your heels in. We used to say in the old church, don't, we don't pat a cake with the devil. We resist him and he flees. Amen? Amen. Okay. Praise God. So in your houses, start proclaiming. Start walking around. Start taking authority. Get you some anointed oil out. Start proclaiming God's presence and peace over every situation where you live. Amen? Amen. So change your heart. We're talking about developing a culture of love and honor. So what does this phrase mean? The phrase change of heart is an idiotic um, an idiom. It's an expression in the English language or a phrase it necessarily um, imply a physical heart change. It has to do with a conversion or an opinion of a statement. It means to change your mind. So it's kind of like repentance. It's to revise your thinking. It means to change your opinion regarding something. For something you once believed to be true, now you've changed your mind to understand. Sometimes as we grow in Christ or we grow up, things that we thought were true, our perceptions begin to change. And the way that we thought about it, we've changed the way we now think about it and the way that we now see it. So it's kind of like this. I'm going to recap for last week. Last week he started talking about, and we're going to stay in Isaiah 119. I really want you guys to go back and read the whole chapter. I began to read the whole thing and, and see where Israel is and what God is actually saying to them before we get to this. But our major verse that we're anchoring on is, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. We're talking about our willingness in our obedience, right? This is from a commentary. This is David, David Guggen says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Here God offered Judah a choice. They could find hope in the midst of their chastisement, relief of their empty religious rituals, and cleansing from their sins. But they had to surrender their heart before God and not refuse and rebel. Instead, they had to be willing and obedient. So last week when I was there, I believe that God is mathematical. And it says, and, and I looked at it this way, if you're willing plus obedience equals good. If you want God's good, you have to be willing and obedient. There's that Whoever the kids are in school, remember conjunction, junction, what's your function? And, but, or. Okay, right? Everyone knew it. 
so addition, so when you're conjunct, when you're conjoining something means you're adding to. It's used to joining elements. So you can't have willingness without obedience and being the goodness of God. Right? I'm just changing it up. I'm only doing it saying it in a different way so you can think about it in a different context. So you cannot have willingness and not be obedient. Some people say, I'm willing, but I just don't want to do that. You're not willing, right? So oh, he, my husband said this last week. Obedience brings behavioral changes, and willingness brings heart change. Obedience is good, but adding willingness and honor is better. So I'm not saying there's not merit in self-discipline and obedience, because there is merit in that, right? But obedience is what you're supposed to do. You don't get a pat on the back for that. Obedience is what you're supposed to do. So I'm going to say it like this. We don't go around and say, oh, thank goodness I didn't rob a bank today. I should be blessed for that, right? It sounds ludicrous, right? Oh, I didn't speed today, so tomorrow if I speed, I won't get a ticket. But that's how we treat God sometimes. I didn't fornicate. I didn't sleep around. Let me put it in today's vernacular. Do I get a pat on the back for doing what God told me to do? No. <laughs> or I tithe last year. Or I prayed last week. There where I should be covered for a while. But sometimes we treat, I tithe, I go to church, I pray, as if God owes us something or we should get a pat on the back for doing what we're supposed to do. You don't get a benefit of that. That's what you're supposed to do. But you are not being lawful. That's for you. You don't get put in jail. You not being lawful in the spirit means you don't get spiritually bound up. You don't get in jail with God or with sin or entanglements with the enemy. It keeps you free. It's not for God. Sinning is for you, not for God. It keeps you in right relationship with him. It keeps you freed in your mind, your will, and your emotion in the realms of your soul so you're not bound to things and tied up in things or entangled in things that keep you from the purpose and the plan and the will of God. So not sinning is for you, baby. It's not for God. He's good. You're the one who's going to be in trouble either way, right? <laughs> so religion without righteousness in vain. So this is what we're going to talk about. I'm just going to give you an overview of the whole chapter of Isaiah 1. I want you to do your homework. Go out there and do it. So the prophet points out the great distress and discomfort that had overtaken the country. And then he points out the sins of the ruling officials and governors, right? So what may be called personal and private sin as drunkenness, vanity, which is excessive pride and admiration of, of, admiration of one's self-appearance and, and achievements, bribery, oppression of the poor, are viewed in a public hearing and bringing a disaster on the whole nation. So in other words, in Israel's time, what they were doing privately was affecting the nation, which means your sin does not stay to yourself. No matter if you think you got away with it, you did not. It's affecting the whole pot. And sometimes I think we think that, oh, well, you know, it's just a, a little lie. <laughs> it's just a little unforgiveness. It's just a little bitterness, a, bit, a little bit of resentment. It sickens the whole entire body, and God was tired of it. We'll laugh in a minute. <laughs> no man can sin to himself. His most private sins has consequences on the whole community. In reply, the nation pointed to the splendid ritual and insinumeral sacrifices and temple services. In other words, they were going to church, they were doing their sacrifices, but yet they were still doing their stuff on the side. They were straddling between two fences. They were trying to live with shades of gray, and it doesn't work that way, right? But these observances only added to their sin because they were done in accordance to rule of law and they carried out, they were carried out with many, minimal effort and reflection. In other words, they barely did it. They halfway did it. They weren't passionate about the things of God. They weren't passionate about giving their sacrifices. It was just something, I just have to do it. The sacrifice of God is a broken and contrite heart. The outward is absolutely worthless unless the expression of the inward heart or mind are present. So in other words, it can look good, but not be good. You can learn Christianese. You can learn to say the right things, but in your heart, you cussing people out. They're getting on your nerves. Oh, praise the Lord, saints. These people are getting on my nerves. I can't stand them. Your inner dialogue. 
And God says, I don't want duality in you. I want you to be authentic in who you are. So who you say you are needs to be who you are. And we need to bring those things into place because God searches the mind and heart. He knows everything. He knows what you were thinking. Not just what you say. Right? But where there's pure in the Holy Spirit and present is, pre is present, then we have a significant value unto the Lord, right? So today I'm going to be talking about transformational versus transactional. God wants us to transform and not just transact with him. Because we have learned to do church and we have learned to do obedience transactionally. And that's what my husband says. We did a real good of teaching our kids to obey, but we did not teach our kids how to honor. Because honor is a heart. I do it not just because you're looking at me. Because sometimes, oh, yeah, they'll do it because you're there and you have a belt and they're threatened and they feel scared. But I told my kids, my kids said, I'm scared of you, Mama. Say, no, you ain't that scared because if you were, you wouldn't do it when I wasn't here. They're not that scared. They're only scared to get caught. Not scared enough not to do. So really, there isn't a heart change. They're only doing it in my presence. It's lip service. It's not a reality to their lives where they're going to do it and understand that they're going to get glory and honor from God for being obedient, right? So transactional faith looks like this, or sounds like this. If I do X, then God will do Y. So what happens when we take on a transactional mentality in the church? We start expecting to get things when we want them. We lose sight of the fact that we aren't the ones who get to decide on God's timing. We expect our shopping list prayers to be answered in a timely fashion, right? The way we want, how we want, we want to direct God, right? God, I need you to do A, B, C, D. As if the creator of the heavens and the earth are on your time schedule. However, we should partner with the promises of God, right? We should have stamina, and I really, I don't know when I'll get to this. The church, we need stamina. In the old church, I can't explain it other way. We used to know how to tarry, and I don't know if anybody understands what tearing is. Okay, we don't have to go back that far, but they wouldn't let you off the altar until something broke off of you. And there was this mentality of, I pray until I see the answer. Now we want to have pat praise. We want pat prayers we want all the glory of God all the manifestation of the power of God but we want to do it all in one minute that's just not the way it happens it's not the way it works why you're not faithful can you be faithful in your faithfulness let's look at Bible I'm going off top topic am I already at 36 minutes Jesus there's no way okay I'm not even halfway through my notes okay so <laughs> Jesus, I looked at that clock up there, that time clock, I almost got scared. <laughs> we have to pray until no matter how long. If it takes 20 years, if it takes 30 years, if it takes 40 years, we have to be faithful until we see what God has promised us. That builds in us stability and strength. Too many times if we don't get an instantaneous dwarfing hit, we are out. And that's just not the way it works. Or God is not on your timetable or schedule. Let me just say it that way. So sometimes we feel like if I pray hard enough, God will heal my relationships. If I go to Bible study, then my kids are covered. If I get involved in church, nothing bad will ever happen to me because I'm in this little protective bubble. I remember my mother told me when she was sick, she says, baby, it rains on the just and unjust alike. So we have to learn to go through some things because God doesn't let us escape all. So now he lets you escape some things. If he doesn't let you escape this thing, you get mad at God. We don't get, to, it's not transactional. We don't get to get mad because we didn't get the desired thing that we wanted. We have to go like Job and say, though you slay me, God, yet I trust you. Though it's difficult, I don't care how I feel right now, but I, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I am willing to go through whatever I go to because I have a promise that's heaven. This earth is not my home. I'm looking for eternity. So I will go through whatever I need to go through. I will do whatever I have to do. Why? Because I'm not looking short-sighted as how I feel right now in this present moment. I'm looking to the glory that shall be revealed, and he's going to give it to me. So we have to change our perspective and change our heart to say, God, I will endure. God, I will go through. God, I will. Whatever happens to me, I can make it. I'm concerned because this generation, what if we were in the days of the Bible with, with the apostles? They were being killed for their faith. Someone came in here and threatened to kill you, say, deny Jesus. How many of you would be willing to go through the pain? 
It's easy to say, oh, I live for God. I, I give my heart for Jesus until he does something you don't like. So what happens when you don't get what you expect? I know this is, this is real church. We don't, I told y'all, we don't, we, don't, we don't do fake church here. We do first, real church here, right? Sometimes you don't get everything you pray for. Sometimes it doesn't happen the way you want it, but you have to keep on and press on anyway. Sometimes God is burning things out of you for the greater good, and he doesn't care about your flesh. He cares about you being holy. He doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about will you endure to the end. He cares about your faithfulness. He cares about your justice. He cares about your kindness. He cares about your love. And if he has to shake and shift and do whatever he has to do to get that junk out of you, he will. That's exactly what he did to Israel. He said, I'm going to burn it all off of you like dross. Sometimes we go through a burning season and it feels hot and it feels heavy. But will you stay faithful to the end and endure? That's the question, right? So the problem with this kind of faith is it sets a person up for disappointment because it's transactional. God will not be controlled or bound by our expectations. We are not in co-equal relationship with God. God does not owe you anything. And if you do something for God, he does not have to pay you back. He's done it all. Why? Because you deserve hell. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it real. You deserve hell. Why do we act like we're so good and we've just been so sanctified and holy? Are you kidding me? We deserve hell. Thank goodness for his mercy and grace. We don't get what we deserve. So if he didn't do anything else for you, he gave his son Jesus to die for you. That's enough, baby. You got to be good with that. Because I'm concerned with young Christians. If you don't get it, then you get mad. Excuse you? It's like my kids. <laughs> Baby, that's outside of your funnel. If you can't handle my no, you definitely can't handle my yes. Because I'm the parent. If I say no, it's no. If you can't receive it, my kids are grown now. Guess what? Make it on your own then, baby. <laughs> Pay those bills. <laughs> See how that works for you. You think God is a good parent? He doesn't train us the same way, test us the same way for us to what? Mature and to grow up into the things of Christ. We've got to get out of doing things for duty or I'll be punished into deep intimacy and relationship with Jesus because we have nothing of value to exchange with God. We are not on equal footing with God. Our righteousness is, is filthy rags is what the Bible says. Sometimes in our, in our quality and we deserve this in our entitlement, we think we're equal with God. We are not equal God. He is holy. We are not. He is God by himself. The old folks are in nobody else. He is God, right? There are relations in our lives that are, are transactional. Let's look at working and retail, for example. I'm an employee and you are the customer, right? You need something, I'll help you get it. <laughs> that relationship is transactional, but it doesn't describe the way we should be with God. Some people have reduced coming to church as transactional. So now people come to church, well, if I don't get what I want, I ain't going to that church. I don't feel the spirit in that church. The Holy Spirit's not moving that church. If someone gets saved, the Holy Spirit was there. Don't reduce the Holy Spirit down to a feeling. He's more than a feeling. He's God. He's holy. People can't get saved with him. They can't get the word without him. So if, the, if people, that's happening, then the Holy Spirit's in the church. Stop saying, I'm so, I'm so tired of people. Well, I, I'm just not getting fed. Baby, babies, eat. Start, pick up your fork and put something in there. They can be, they can be they can six be, months old. Six a baby will, fi they will find some food and put it in their mouths. If you're a Christian telling me you can't eat, I'm wondering where your Bible is. Are you on Facebook? Is your face in the book? What you tell me, because nobody has to feed you but you. That's your responsibility, right? I'm, I'm tired of the nonsense. We got to do church for real. When you became a Christian, you said you loved Jesus. He said he was supposed to save you. He said he would never leave you or forsake you. That's his job. Don't put anybody else in that place. Not a pastor, not a husband, not a wife, not a kid. Nobody belongs in that place but God. So instead of being transactional, our faith must be transformational. Transformational faith is one where we are transformed by the presence of God in our lives, right? This process which forms Christ's characters in the believer of the ministry of the Spirit in the context of community and according to biblical standards, which this involves transformation of the whole person, thought, behavior, style, and relating to God. He will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because you're submitted to his will. 
So this is what happens a lot of times. If you guys can put my tree up there, this is where we're going. Give them a few minutes. I have this tree. I love it. It's a teaching aid. You guys know I'm a teacher. So let's see if we can get it. No, not the video. Not the video. The, te the, actual, the actual tree. I'm sorry. It's okay. We got time. Y'all okay? Okay. Praise the Lord. I'm almost done. There were two trees in the garden. What? You laughing at me? Welcome to the E. No, I was kidding. I was doing that. I did not know it was a gang sign. He was laughing. So it was years of, of laughing. I thought I was doing something cool and learned out it was a gang sign. Check with the kids before you do something. So in the garden, there were two trees. And man has had this problem ever since the beginning. The Bible says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in other words, there's evil in this tree and there's good in this tree. The problem is we get so consumed with our good that it's not God. And we're eating from the wrong tree because anything that we do in self-effort and selfishness does not come from the heart of God. You're eating from the wrong tree. So your good, pride, people pleasing, all the rules, the do's and the don'ts, your self-effort, your experience, religion, all of that is in the wrong tree. This is why parents don't tell your kids they're good. I know that's going to be harsh. Oh, they're good kids. They're bad kids. Don't let them relate to good and bad. Because good doesn't get them anything. They need to be righteous. They need to be holy. They need to be justified. They need to be sanctified. And that comes through eating through the tree of life. Through the word of God. Why? Because we all don't deserve it. So we have to understand that all of this is still in the tree of knowledge. And that knowledge is what sometimes we prefer that because it seems easier. Go ahead, I'll show the video for the kids. So this is a good video, and I thought this would go over for the kids and give them a visual aid so they could see it. It'll help the parents too. You guys can turn the light, get the lights so that they can see it.
thought that was a simple way. Hopefully it helps the kiddos. So Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior or customs in this world, but be transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. We're talking about having a change of heart. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, perfect, and pleasing. See, if we're going to get into all things are possible, and we're going to walk into all things that God has for us, we're going to have to have a change of heart. We must learn to honor and obey out of love, not in duty of law, which produces a legalistic mentality and causes us to eat from the wrong tree. So number one, I have three points, and they're really simple. We're going to do this today. We're going to ask God to search your heart. Don't assume that your heart is righteous, because the Bible tells us already it's not. Psalms 139, 23 says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxieties. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. This is the Message Bible. Investigate my life. That takes a while to, to get open and say, God, investigate my life. Find out if there's any, find everything about me. Cross-examine, test me, get a clear, clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong and then guide me on the road to eternal life. Self-examination, introspective, is very important in, in the life of a Christian. Don't assume that you're just right. Don't assume that you have the right thoughts about something. Start challenging some of these thoughts and ideologies of things that you grew up with to say, God, is that what you're thinking? Is that how you want me to think in this season? And asking God to search you. See, David asked God to search for sin and point it out, even to the level of testing his thoughts. This is an exploratory surgery for sin. How we are to recognize sin unless God points it out, right? Then God shows us and we can repent to be forgiven. So we're going to, at the end, make this verse our prayer. We're going to ask God to see our thoughts. The word rendered thoughts occurs only in this place and in Psalms 94, 19. The idea is search me thoroughly. Examine merely, examine not merely my outward conduct, but what I think about it. In other words, what is my motives about it? What are my purpose about it? What passes through my mind about it? What occupies my imagination? What is lodged in my memory? What secures my affections? What controls my will? We must be sincere when we ask God to do this. Number two, let the word of God expose deception and give you the word of truth. Hebrews 4 tells us this. For the word of God speaks, it is alive and full of power. This is the Amplified. It says, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Listen what the word does. This, I love this part. Penetrating to the dividing line of breath of life, the soul, the immortal spirit, and the joints and marrows, the deepest parts of our nature. Exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of our heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed. But all things are open and exposed and naked and defenseless in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let the word of God analyze you, sift you. Thoughts, processes, things that you thought, let it cut it off of you. It says it's a two-edged sword. He's able to cut you and heal you at the same time. Number three, choose life. Start speaking and eating God's word as never before. You are going to need it in the days to come. Hear me. You can think it's not true. You're going to need to choose life and start speaking and eating God's word like never before. Or you're not going to make it. Let's just be honest. It's going to get rough. You think it's rough out there? It's probably going to get rougher. Are you prepared? I don't want to play church. I want y'all to, to know that the handwriting is on the wall. It's going to happen. We are not going to change it. It's going to be the difference of how you endure and walk through it. Will you be the remnant of the church and will you walk through with the purpose of a God or are you going to be separated and be devoured? That's how serious is getting out there in the spiritual world. I don't want to pat a cane and play. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. No, I don't believe it is. But I'm going to tell you the truth. But I believe that we are built for this and I believe that we can endure and I believe that we win. I'm not hopeless. Why? Because I know the end of the story and we win, right? This is what Deuteronomy 30, 19 says. I call heaven and earth witness to you today that I've set before you death and life, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and my descendants may live. The word willing means, I love this, it says to breathe after. We have to be willing and obedient. We have to breathe after the things of God. It means to acquiesce. It means to consent, be willing. 
So all the, the little things fall off this. You guys know about the tree of the fruit of the spirit, which would be on the tree, right? Love, joy, peace. But the problem is the world makes this tree look so appetizing. We think a little lying, not that big deal. A little disobedience of your kids, a little disobedience will send you, will get you in a lot of disobedience and a lot of trouble. Fighting. Doubt and worry. These things keep you from the fullness of God. This tree gossip. What's on here? Grudges. Resentment is killing the church. Killing us. Killing us. Talking about stuff we have no business on Facebook. Talking about people's business. Mind your business. You ain't got time for nobody else's. That's why I don't get on Facebook. Because I I really, honestly, I just see a bunch of people that need to mind their business. You ain't got enough time. If you take care of yourself, you don't really have enough time to be talking about what somebody else should and could be doing. What should you and could you be doing? That's what you need to be focused on. And what is God telling you to do, right? Addiction. We think, it's, you know, all of these things, but they're causing us to eat from the wrong tree. When I see on the Facebook and it's gossip and they're talking about somebody else and they don't have a right to it, don't click on it, don't give it a like. Why are you participating in gossip? See, we keep participating in those things, but we keep on expecting the fruit of righteousness in our lives. And it just doesn't work that way. We have to love, have goodness. We have to have self-control. We have to have faithfulness. All of these things will lead to a deeper life. I really want, I didn't have time. I wanted to put candy on this tree because I think sometimes we think that tree looks better than this tree. But this tree is where all the sweet and good stuff is. This will get you to the fullness of God and a blessed and lush life. It may be hard on the front end, but baby, at the end, it pays dividends that you you would not even believe. This tree promises easy, yes, easy to lie, easy to gossip, it's easy to get mad, it's easy to be disobedient. But the back end is bondage, destruction, and death. So you have two choices, blessing and cursing. You have two choices, light and darkness. And God keeps on putting us through these same, these things that are pitted against each other. Having you say you have choices. Every day you have a choice when you get up. You have a choice to get in the word or you have a choice to get up on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you do. You have a choice to get up and pray or you have a choice to get up and gossip and get on the phone. You are making choices every day. And each time you keep on eating from one fruit or the other or one tree from the other. And all I'm saying is choose wisely. We got the same 24 hours, seven days a week. There's no excuses. There's not like somebody has more and you have less. We get the same. And what we do with it is can change our lives, right? So let's stand up. We're going to pray. Guys, give me something. Give me Dappy, something that um, Facebook, whoever out there, I guess, uh, what is it, uh, YouTube. If you guys be blessed. We'll put on some music and they'll cut us off if we put on any music, anybody else's music. And we're just going to pray. So I'm going to ask you guys as they put the music.